First of all, we don't, we don't get a chance to be in the presence of an incredible man like you that has so much wisdom and knowledge. And so I want to check in with you on the state of the world. What's happening? <laughs> what do we have to watch out for? How do we make it better? You always talk about the arc of justice. How do we make it bend towards it? Well, you've heard me say a million times that basically, as we've learned the last few years, that bad news makes more news than good news and triggers more, you know, retweets and all that. And so a lot of good news is not known. The trend lines are better than the headlines. That's all true. But there are some alarming trend lines in the world and in America. Uh, so let's talk about it. In general, in spite of all this fighting you hear about in Syria and Yemen and Sudan and other places, basically the level of organized institutionalized violence is still pretty low by historical standards. That doesn't mean that we don't have a calamitous crisis in the Middle East, and it's one of the big drivers of the fact that we have more refugees than at any time since World War II, and also in some places in Africa. The headlines are deceiving when it comes to climate change. The recent article just came out uh, saying that the bottom line on sustainability in 20. 18 is where we got about 12 years to get ourselves in the position to do something really, really serious. Good news is you could do it economically. I, I continue to believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we change the way we produced and consumed energy, it could lead us into a new era of economic prosperity. It could avoid the most calamitous consequences of climate change. And it could put off, it could buy us 10 or 20 years before we might have to face the consequences of the fact that the combined revolutions in artificial intelligence, robotics, and nanotechnology could make this, could make this the first technological revolution since the dawn of the industrial age to kill more jobs than it creates. And when that happens, we will either have to pay calamitous tax rates to support idle people or figure out a way to democratize the benefits of productivity and shorten the work week everywhere. And if people are still producing the same amount, pay them the same amount we were. But that's going to be a massive organizational undertaking. And therefore, I'm really worried about the climate change thing. I think. The Paris Agreement is good. It's possible that America, just because of the governors and the mayors who agree, could meet its Paris goals even with the United States, the current administration, rejecting it. But it's a really, really serious problem. And, uh, you know, I've done, and I don't have a lot of money for this in my foundation, but I do a lot of work in the Caribbean with governments and with the private sector trying to make the Caribbean the first completely green energy electricity region in the world. They have the highest electric rates in the world. You all remember this if you're interested in it for what you're investing in. The highest electric rates in the world. And it's the one place where you can go right now and invest in all the solar and wind energy you want, make a profit, and lower electric rates. And one of the reasons that Puerto Rico is in the trouble it's in today is the way they did their utility. I won't bore you with all the details, but I'm, I have been trying now, this will be the 11th year, I have been banging my head against that wall, trying to get them to change this, but I, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about the preservation of democracy with the current information ecostructure. I mean, if you look at what happened in Brazil, for example, they elected a guy that wanted to tear down the rainforest. Whatever you think about President Lula, he cut deforestation in the rainforest by 75%. Do 
Tearing down the rainforest is basically a dumb idea unless you're an individual person. This is like individual versus group ventures. There is almost no topsoil in the rainforest. So you can cut down an acre of rainforest and plant soybeans for a couple of years and then it's not any good anymore. You run through the soybeans. The cattle will graze it over in a year and eat up all the topsoil. There's just, it's just, it's a lousy idea. There are tens of millions of acres in Brazil, not under cultivation, not in a rainforest. Brazil and Argentina have the biggest stretch of land in the world with 20 feet of topsoil. They need something like the land rush we did in Oklahoma and other places in the 19th century in America. And instead they elected a guy who basically promised to be an authoritarian because of their sense that everything's out of control in Brazil and democracy wouldn't work for them anymore because they got rather wealthy with commodity products high, then they got low, and then they had the corruption scandals and they went back to that. You got, but you had a, a nationalist government on the verge of taking over Austria, and Austria has got one of the best balanced economies in Europe. Not a lot of income inequality, a lot of agriculture, a lot of manufacturing, and it's more than the Alps and opera. It's a very interesting country, but they're still scared of the other. So I think we got to, I think democracy and all this pollution of the social media and uh, people relying on that for news and then not knowing whether it's true or not adds to the fragility of democracy because if you're a citizen and you believe that you never will know for the rest of your life whether what you read or try to learn about any problem is true or not, then you might as well just pick the best dictator. Let everybody run for dictator and pick the one you like best because you're never going to be able to be an informed citizen. Anyway, this is a mortal threat to democracy and we're going to have to really fight to reestablish the norms of democratic society. I think um, international cooperation for peace and for denuclearization and continuing to reduce the threat of weapons of mass destruction is a danger. I think the continuing economic dislocation is a danger. Uh, I think that for if you're an American, I think that people are saying, well, is all this nationalist movement, is this about economics or is it about race or is it about culture? And the real answer is it's about all of it because if you're not part of, uh, the, the real problem is not poverty so much as it is a sense of stagnation. And all over the world, there are vast populations that used to be the dominant social and political forces in their country with the feeling of economic, social, and psychological stagnation. That's why you got life expectancy going down among a lot of white working class people in areas where this opioid epidemic is going wild. On the other hand, we have reduced overall global poverty. Overall life expectancy is going up worldwide. Infant mortality is going down. There's a lot of good stuff happening. But what we really need to do is go back to thinking. And this is an age of resentment and quick judgment. And it's just inadequate to meet the kind of challenges we face. So uh, I think I'm very encouraged in the United States about all these women that are running for office and winning, I think, but mostly because if you look at them, they're incredibly diverse. They're not all alike at all in terms of their politics or anything else. The, the congressional elections in the last time were fascinating to me because there were people with all these different backgrounds that shared one thing in common. They were well connected to the people they were trying to represent. And, and that, that I think is important because it was real. My, my favorite, it uh, turned out to be a harbinger of the 2018 election, was the transgender woman who won 
a 20-year Republican seat in the Senate in Virginia. And here's her speech, running for the state Senate in Virginia, Northern Virginia. She defeated a 20-year Republican incumbent. She said, uh, I do not want you to vote against me because I'm transgender. But I don't want you to vote for me because I am. I want you to vote for me because you can't get to work on time and you can't get home in time to have dinner with your kids. And the other guy's been there for 20 years and all he wants to do is channel, or channel the rhetoric coming out of Washington. I don't care about any of that. I want you to vote for me because I'll help get you to work on time and get you home to have dinner with your kids. And she won in a walk. Why? Because she gave the politics back to the people in a way they could identify with. And because the election was so inherently interesting, it was covered in a totally neutral way. I don't know about the social media, but I mean, you know, the TV and the newspapers and everything, they're just with neutral coverage, just, oh, this is interesting. I mean, if you told me three years ago that a Native American lesbian kickboxer could be elected to Congress in Kansas, <laughs> I wouldn't believe it. But I'll tell you this, if you saw her stick, you'd have voted for her. <laughs> I mean, because she was connected to the people she was trying to represent. And a lot of this is going to have to be handled at the grassroots level where people are just giving the political system back to the voters. And anything that, you, you should all attune your ears to that too and the issues you're interested in. Don't let people get between you and what you need from your government, because we could be looking at 50 or 70 years of calamity in the world if the democratic structures continue to weaken and these authoritarian impulses that you see in China and Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Iran, all over, everywhere, if it gets more instead of less. You want to free more people. You don't want to tie them down. And you want people to feel comfortable with diversity, not threatened by it. And I think that's at the core of all of this. You charged us with implementing the 17 apps, and I appreciate that very much. You have a lot of people from around the world here with different and high levels of influence. What can we do as individuals to save democracy from social pol media pollution you mentioned and all the... All well, the I think you can... Um, first of all, most politicians are people. <laughs> Don't forget oh. that. I'm, no, they really are. I mean, I realize, I, I can't tell you, I could always tell if I was looking at somebody and I wasn't a person of them. I remember when some of the craziest stuff was going on when I was running in 92 and they accused me of being responsible for the deaths of two boys on a railroad track and just all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. I called this young man who had worked for me since he was 25 years old and I said, what do you think about all this stuff they're saying? He said, they're talking about someone I'm not familiar with, he said. <laughs> I just, uh, not too long ago I went, I was home in Arkansas and I drove 70 miles down to a little retirement facility to see my high school world history teacher, who was 14 years older than me, so he was 86 then. And he was dying and he had Alzheimer's, but he knew who he was for an hour a day, so I went to see him at the appointed hour and he was clear-headed and we had a great hour. But, uh, and he was later an education aide for me when I was governor, and I was thinking about, uh, I think, my advice is that you should do things that give your endeavors meaning to ordinary people. There's not a person, Republican or Democrat, whoever they voted for for president or anything else, can't identify with what you're trying to do. You ought to be able to build 90% support for any reasonable things you're trying to do. And then you ought to deal with the legitimate concerns people have or, you know, a lot of people push back on you on all this transparency stuff. But the truth is, I think the benefits you would get 
out of a transparent system. And you have bent over backwards not to try to stand like a skull or, you know, make people feel bad or anything like that. But there are just so many... This system grew up in, in such a way, as we all know, with layer upon layer upon layer of this, that, and the other thing. And uh, those of you who are in it know you're dealing with this problem today and there's some other problem next week and all that. I, I think we have to examine all this now. We've reached the point where the cost of avoidable deaths are unsustainable on a human as well as an economic level. And the options for dealing with it are before us but we can't get from here to there unless people feel it's all right. And I, I think if I were you, I would try to broaden the popular base of support by it for not describing people who disagree with you as demons, but giving the issue back to the people. Look at one of the people won these close races. They won it because for once, everybody was forced to just get real. What can you do? What can you not do? What are you going to do when you get up in the morning? I think that's my advice. My advice is that you should try to broaden the base of support and make it an issue that everybody cares about. Because most people, trust me, they, they're really interested in this. Anybody that's ever been in a hospital is interested in this. But they don't know much about the details. And we got some serious public health challenges in America to go way beyond hospital safety, just public health challenges. And I hope, my advice is I would do that. And I would try to look for unlikely allies. And I think, you know, you pass, uh, we passed those two bills at the end of the last Congress and President Trump signed them. Overwhelming bipartisan support. A lot of these people are gonna be looking for things they can do with members of the other party. And I'd load up. But just keep it real. Don't, don't call anybody a name. Don't turn anybody's temperature up. We got enough people foaming at the mouth on television every day. <laughs> Nobody, you don't want to see one more person you think needs a shot. <laughs> I mean, we just make something good happen. And I think, you know, I think we need that everywhere. I, I wish I had several people who went through the photo line from Great Britain what was going to happen now. I think it, the people ought to be given another vote. It'd be, I don't know if it's possible, but they clearly are uncertain about where to go. And so I also think, uh, if I might make some defense of the poor beleaguered politicians, in a democracy, one of the things that you do face is that there are limits to how much change people can absorb and understand at one time. Especially when so many of those changes affect their identity. You know, where am I in the midst of all this? What does it mean to be British or American or South African? How's Cyril Ramaphosa, who's a really smart businessman in South Africa, gonna deal with the fact that there are landless South Africans that would like to have access to land and he would like to give them access to land without having to throw anybody off their land because otherwise he winds up with all the problems they got in Zimbabwe, which he doesn't want and shouldn't have. I mean, these are problems all over the world. And he, it all comes down to identity. And we have got to develop a level of consciousness which enables us to embrace diversity and to create stakeholder societies so that people that don't have a lot of money but have a lot of skin in the game get heard too. That's what I think the, the big problem in every one of these issues, when you get right down to it, is that. And Mandela was a genius at that. You know, hosting the World Rugby Cup and at a time when rugby was a symbol of uh, the apartheid lovers. There's one black guy on the rugby team that, from South Africa that won the World Cup. And Mandela went all over the country wearing his rugby jersey. He knew what he, he was one smart guy. But we have to find a way to give each other a sense of social and personal security and worth and belonging. 
and then make these changes, including the changes that you need here that you can't do without some government support of some kind. For example, if you want to get people to share things which might cost them a lot of money, there's got to be a way to make adjustments for that that would give greater incentives to do that. And the government can't afford to do all this stuff without the private sector, not everywhere, even, even if, if you look at the national health system in the UK, they still have various things that are done in the private sector that feed in to the health ecostructure that are quite important. That's my advice. My advice is build a broader base and learn how to talk about this in simple terms so that people understand that what you're doing could enable their grandchildren to live longer, healthier lives. I love that. There seems to be two types of people. One that sees that also helping others is in their self-interest, and one that sees that only helping themselves and their clan is in their self-interest. First of all, is a second group right? And if they're not right, what can we do to get them to see that their self-interest is also in helping others? You, know, you talk about the well, interdependence. And the truth is, in the short run, it looks like they are right right now, but they're not. That is, ever since our, our first ancestors moved from being isolated people who coupled to families and then to clans, all of human existence has been in part a struggle between us and them, who's us, who's them. For a long time when we were all hunter-gatherers, there was a real rational basis to us and them. If there's a limited amount of food, you want us to get it and so they can't have it. But as soon as any cooperative endeavor started, including agriculture, we began to have examples of win-win situation where our lives would be richer if other people did well too. And then all the great uh, faith systems, Judaism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Christianity, Islam, in its non-political form, Allah put different people on the earth, not that they might despise one another, but that they might know one another and learn from one another. Everybody that ever thought about the fleeting nature of individual human life and the fleeting nature of power and what you really will value on your deathbed, which is not who you whacked and made feel small, but who you loved and who you liked, how the flowers smelled in the springtime, eventually comes to the place where you realize that it's the, the best solutions are win-win, that life is not a zero-sum game. We are social creatures. I've recommended this book twice to two of these patient safety conferences, but if you want to read the best single-volume book making this argument, read E.O. Wilson's The Social Conquest of Earth. He's almost 90 years old now. He is a prize-winning microbiologist who is the world's foremost authority on ants. And he is a wise man with the mind of a young man. And so he wrote these three books that he thought were the capstone of his life and he got a bunch of energy and wound up writing two more. But anyway, one of them is called The Meaning of Human Existence and there's another one and then there's, but the most important one for the time you're living in and what you're trying to do about building this movement is the social conquest of Earth. And he traces, insofar as you can know it, in about 240 pages, the history of all life on the planet. And he concludes that the most successful species that ever lived, if you define success, is the opportunity to be extinguished and escaping it 
and enduring are ants, termites, bees, and people. And honeybees are in trouble today, but there are lots of other bee species that are doing well. And he said, the reason that all four of them did so well is that they are the greatest cooperators. And he gives lots of examples of all species. And he said, now people are the greatest cooperators because they have two things ants, termites, and bees don't have, consciousness and a conscience. But because they are self-aware, they are prone to arrogance and error so we keep having to pull our chestnuts out of the fire right before we get burned. But so far, we've avoided it. And it's basically an optimistic book, and it's hard on him being optimistic because species are disappearing from planet Earth at the most rapid rate in 10,000 years, another consequence of climate change and resource abuse. And, um, but he explains that the only way you can do it is if there is a very, very high level of cooperation. And that's really what I believe. You talk about climate change. And there was a major scientific report recently released uh, by 13 different federal agencies talking about the consequences of climate change. And, you know, I want your take on what about the security related to climate change? Well, first of all, this is going to be, we're already living with this. Uh, there's no question that water shortage, for example, has aggravated the problems in the Middle East. You can get on the internet and see the 20 hottest places on average on Earth. And they're in Iran, Iraq, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, three or four in Algeria, interestingly enough, one in California, Phoenix, and one other in America. But most of these places are poorer and destabilized because of the loss of natural resources. This is going to get worse. The ice caps are melting more rapidly now. The ice cover on Greenland is melting more rapidly. If it does, in all probability, not only will the sea levels rise, but they will block the current flow of the Gulf Stream. If that were to happen, there would be more storms on the east coast of America blocked from being blown out to sea, which the prevailing winds normally do, and the far north could get even colder in the winter. And these things will interrupt life as we know it. I mean, uh, in the 2016 election, we, I experienced what could have been a, a, a climate change consequence of, in North Carolina, where the storms that year hit America very hard, and people's lives were too disorganized to vote. I mean, that's just a minor example. I mean, it's, we could lose a massive amount of Florida, a lot of our coastal cities here, a lot of Manhattan could be underwater. And it's the, it looks like the Atlantic will go south, if you will, before the Pacific does. But this is going to be incredibly disruptive. And it doesn't have to happen. But it is happening. We've had, it's not an accident, in each of the last three decades, insured losses from natural disasters have tripled. The cost of insured losses have tripled. And keep in mind, that's just measuring what rich folks are going through, because poor folks don't have insurance, and poor countries don't have insurance systems. So it's not like this isn't going on. And um, when my daughter was in high school, all of her cute little friends used to say, denial is not just a river in Egypt. <laughs> I mean, we basically are even those of us that think of ourselves as tree huggers are denying how imminent this is. And there's just a thousand things we could do to make it better, and we ought to do it. And reorganizing ourselves would literally generate work, businesses, opportunities. A thousand more people like you were 30 years ago when you started this company. And God only knows how many jobs. And it would put off the day of reckoning 
when we have to figure out what the hell we're going to do about artificial intelligence and robotics and nanotechnology and the combination of them. I personally think we'll wind up going for a four-day work week so everybody can handle the dignity of work and so we don't have to have exorbitant tax rates to pay for those of us who have it to pay other people to exist without the dignity of work. Could be a happy time if we do it right. But, this, but the climate change thing is an existential threat. And, and the United States military and intelligence people have thought of it as a serious security threat since 2000. And have been trying to tell everybody this. And more than ever, we need all of us to be nice to each other, because you never know who needs to move to whose home. <laughs> you know, the wall we're trying to build, one day might be blocking us trying to get shelter from Mexico, into Mexico. Yeah, look, I mean, this is America, this is we can laugh. At First thing, one of the interesting things is this wall deal is coming at a curious time in our history. We had a lot more illegal immigrants coming, uh, undocumented immigrants coming to America when I was president because we were leading the world out of a slow period. And we were like a magnet, and Mexico was fairly dysfunctional. And then President Zedillo and his successors began to modernize. Uh, two presidents ago, the president of Mexico was a man named Calderon. Uh, Calderon created 140, or one president ago, 140 tuition-free universities. Last year, Mexico educated 100,000 engineers. We were three times their population. We educated 120,000. So you only see about Mexico when there's some big narco-trafficking violence. But the truth is, they're trying to build a sustainable economy, and the net in migration from Mexico since 2010 has been zero. I don't have the last two years, but I'm just telling you that from 2010, through the end of 2014, 140, 50,000 more Mexicans went back to Mexico than came to the United States. <laughs> the end migration is from Central America, from countries that have been wrecked by the narco traffickers. Our biggest immigration crisis is illegal heroin and cocaine from south of the border and illegal fentanyl coming in from China in cargo containers which is another reason it would be better. I have no objection to us having serious trade disputes with China over certain issues. But most of what they did was done in the first 15 years of this new era. And now China is spending a lot of money trying to clean up their environment and trying to make sure that they're more influential than we are because they save and we squander. And so they're investing money, not just in China, but also in Africa and other Asian countries and elsewhere. And they got it. I still think people would prefer our model if they think it works, because the Chinese have also become more authoritarian and territorial, which I personally believe is a mistake. We're better off sharing the future. You sh we should prepare for the worst. We should realize that there are very few permanent victories or permanent defeats in political affairs. And demons rear their head all the time. Most of what's happened hadn't surprised me all that much because I grew up in the South in the 1950s and 60s. I've seen this movie before. <laughs> but it won't end well unless we change what we're doing. The, uh, but uh, anyway, I think, uh, I believe that the good news is none of our problems are insoluble. The good, the bad news is they are inconsistent, solving them is inconsistent with tribal separatist nationalism. It is inconsistent with an us and them mentality. It is inconsistent with wanting everything in an eight-second soundbite, and it is inconsistent with looking for who you can resent today instead of how we can all build tomorrow to, together. And so it's not as, and if you're looking for a quick hit, it's not as emotionally satisfying as all this other stuff. 
And it's also, I mean, you know, it's one thing to talk about how terrible things are in West Virginia. It's another thing to figure out what to do with people who are buried deep down in Appalachia with no good roads out to the, even the nearest populated areas. Overnight, we got a map and <laughs> look at the roads that connect West Virginia to Kentucky, for example, or don't. I mean, so anyway, I just think we just need to, we're getting there. We just need to take a deep breath and realize that we're still around because we've always been able to cooperate. But we have been extremely careless, I think, with our assets. We take for granted that our democracy will always be there. We take for granted that we'll always come back. We take for granted that all this, you know, the dinosaurs were feeling pretty good about themselves, too, until that asteroid struck 65 million years ago. I mean, they were a heck of a lot bigger and stronger than we are. <laughs> so you, just, you don't know how much time you have, and you just got to sort of make the most of it. But I think on balance, I feel good, that, and I especially feel good about what we could do if we'd stop believing life is a zero-sum game and realize that win-win works better than win-lose. You know, you mentioned that when things are in disarray, when we have politics of uh, fear and division, that entrepreneurs like me won't come out to solve some of the problems that need to be solved. But I think one of the reasons that you hit on that we've slowed down in our success in getting people to commit to do more in helping save lives is because of the disarray around the world. When there's no stability, it's hard to get people to pay attention on the, the luxuries, if you will, although uh, these are far, far, far away from being luxuries. Well, I agree with it. Look, first of all, it's, people are distracted and worried and they don't know what to do. And they figure, and the economy is finally, it's hard to underestimate how much damage the financial crisis did to the body politic not just in America, but elsewhere. But for example, we are not in the second year of job growth. We are in eight and a half years and counting of solid job growth. And one of the reasons we're doing as well as we are is that our economy is outperforming most other countries. But still the workforce participation rate, it's about 62.7% of people by age. So you say the unemployment rate is 3.7%. It is. But there are still a lot of people that are out there who were left out of it. We got up to 67% participation rate in my last two years. So our 4% unemployment rate was in effect lower than 3.7 now because everybody who wanted to work could. And you still, you have all these people that are out there that they just feel trapped. They, we're sitting, the one thing that's, that I know about you is that you would not be here if you did not think you could make this better. Isn't that right? You may be frustrated, but you wouldn't have showed up here if you didn't think you could. Is that right? You have no idea, maybe, how many people there are who get up every single day in this country with all of its assets, never mind all these places around the world, and they look in the mirror and they think every one of their tomorrows will be just like yesterday. And that is a devastating feeling. And it, stagnation hurts worse than poverty. And I'm not being insensitive. Look, I think I'll be the last American president talking about public health whoever lived in a home without indoor plumbing. It's a great political story, but trust me, that is way overrated, living without indoor plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> but my point is, we, I, I, just, I don't want us to be careless. I want us to be caring and careful. But I'm, I, I'm upbeat. Our economy is very strong, and we would already have 
triggered more economic growth in Europe had the Brexit thing not derailed the prospect of our having a better trade relationship with them. We would have had a more balanced approach to Asia and created incentives for the Chinese and us and the Europeans to work together, not across purposes. You know, there's a, it's, this is hard work. You've got to work at this. And, and every national leader should be, you should work for the best and plan for the worst. But working for the, you know, assuming the worst and acting on it and then hoping it comes out all right is not a very good strategy. And that's kind of what we're doing too much of now. I mean, I think, but on balance, there is not a single problem the world faces that can't be dealt with in an intelligent way. And we just kind of waited too long to deal with it. And we got to jerk out of it and get the show on the road. That's a, there is, these scientists that said in that article a couple of months ago that we only had 12 years to really put ourselves on a trajectory for massive uh, reduction in carbon emissions to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. Maybe they've overstated a little bit, but I wouldn't gamble. I think they're probably right. But the good news is it's happening when almost everywhere in America, clean energy is cheaper than the alternative now. That's just w one example. But saying something's cheaper is a lot different than saying, well, if you're going to close the coal-fired power plant, how do the people that have made the investment recover their investment? And how do you affect the transition? And somebody's got to be doing all this work. This is hard work. It's so much more fun just to get on TV and badmouth somebody. <laughs> and it doesn't take any effort. For some people. Huh? For but, some but, people, it's more you, fun. You see what I mean? It's like yeah. this patient safety thing. I can get up and give you all kinds of speeches. I don't have to get up and run a hospital anymore. I don't have to run a medical equipment company and figure out, you know, how are we going to pay for all this and what's transparency and what happens and all that. There are details in all this. The devil is always in the details. But that's why stakeholder groups committed to a common goal are the, it's the only way to do this. And if you keep, you know, and, and I'm not surprised that the rate at which you're increasing the number of life safes slowed down because it was bound to happen. You picked the low hanging fruit, which you exactly should have done. Think of all the lives you saved by picking the low-hanging fruit. Now you've got to go figure out how to plant a new orchard. That's why I've got Dave Mayer and Mike Ramsey coming. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, can you talk about the current opioid epidemic and what are your latest thoughts on how to address it? Talk about something that creeped up on us. Well, the good news is there, A, there are some communities, there was a big article on Dayton, Ohio recently, that have really shown how you can take whatever resources you have and make it better. And we need to get much more, there needs to be money devoted. There was some money in uh, one of these budget bills to spend more money at the federal level to help communities deal with it. So that's good. But what I focus on in my foundation that I think is important is 70,000 people died of drug overdoses last year. Most of them, opioids were involved. 45% of the people who died of overdoses involving opioids were not alone. That is, there was somebody in a room with them, somebody next door, or they were in a public place, a party, or a public where somebody was in 20 steps. Uh, one wonderful little Irish company, Adapt, who's just been sold to a bigger company, made us a great deal on nasal spay, naloxone, Narcan, and uh, agreed to give a free package to every high school in the country as they could, as their profits permitted, and then to any colleges and universities that wanted them. And we've given out, I don't know, 6,000 passages, maybe 50,000 doses or something. But the truth is, this is another one of these things like the AIDS drugs. 
we should, in the near term, have many, 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 many times that. Uh, like people who live in communities that have opioid problems. A lot of them, just random people should have those things with them because people are just dropping like flies, 70,000 people. And you can bring people back. You still have to get them in detox and you have to get them in treatment. You gotta do all this other stuff, but you gotta save their lives first. So I think we need more of that. The other thing is, it's like you wanna do education in the curriculum of patient safety. I've talked to a lot of young people who've been through drug treatment. And I always ask them the same thing. Because Hillary and I have five friends who've lost their children in this epidemic. And three of them, one I don't know, one was a heroin addict who'd been through nine rehabs and just didn't want to live anymore. Loved his parents, thanked them, whole deal, and checked out. Uh, but three of them died because, as smart as they were, they did not know that you cannot m mix opioids with any amount of alcohol and fall asleep without running a serious risk of dying because it deadens a part of your brain and tells your body to breathe while you're sleeping. And one of them worked for Hillary and had worked for me and was a wonderful, luminous young man. Our cross the street neighbor, a Kosovar Albanian immigrant. They had five children, one son, same thing happened to him. Anyway, I don't want to bore you with the details. You've all got these stories, but my point is there was no education program. I asked person after person after person. The only university I knew that was actually providing basic information on this was when Donna Shalala, who is now in Congress from South Florida and was president of the University of Miami and Wisconsin and Hunter College and secretary of HHS under me and then was president of our foundation for a while. She had a program to do this at Miami and I don't know anybody else who did. It was just because of her public health background. And so I talk to young people about it all the time. I mean, when people that come up to me and tell me they just come out of rehab and they're thankful that I'm working on this. So I decided we would start working with state legislatures and now we're trying to get all kinds of legislation passed. I talked to a doctor who's from uh, Southern Pennsylvania and Appal the northernmost edge of Appalachia. And uh, I think that these states should make it very clear that they will permit and support and when necessary finance the use of methadone and buprenorphine as transitional aids to get people off of it. But I talked to a Pentecostal preacher friend of mine who said, it's interesting, you know, I mean, it, I don't even know if he ever voted for me, but he's like a brother to me. And I love this guy and his wife, and we've been friends 40 something years. And her nephew had a opioid problem. And I said, Anthony, do you know that they're not requiring this in any state in the union? They're not requiring schools and public colleges to tell the students that they can die if they mix alcohol and opioids. Three weeks after I told him that, I'm not making this up, three weeks after I told him that, the governor signed a law requiring that to be done. <laughs> I mean, and there are, so we started working with faith communities. We've got this big group in Houston now that's helping us. And we can do this. This is something we can all agree on. And we need to do a lot more of that. So I'm going to do a lot of work this year on the, with the colleges and universities, with the schools, and try to get the state legislatures to do that. And then it's more controversial, but I feel very strongly. I've talked to enough doctors who dealt with this, and I talked to my daughter who knows a lot more about it than we do. And I'm convinced that we've got to push for people who are severely addicted. We've got to produce, uh, push for the 
more options to use transitional treatment that includes methadone and buprenorphine. Maybe even start teaching our kids in fourth or fifth grade about. Oh yeah, but that, well, this bill that I'm talking about required them to start education in elementary levels. Wonderful, wonderful. I mean, it was—it's a great thing. We, we ought to do that every state in America. You can do, here's something that you could do. I know it's not on your agenda here, but you should see what is your state's laws or your country's laws. What what can? Why shouldn't kids be told this? Why shouldn't they? I'll tell you something, in these areas that are really riddled with adults, these kids that are six and seven years old that have parents that are doped out, they know it. And if a child comes home and says, please, mommy, please, daddy, if you're going to take these, uh, you know, Oxycontin or whatever it is, please don't have anything to drink. It can kill you. If you fall asleep, you might never wake up. That have a big difference. Seventy thousand people is twice as many people as get killed by gunshots every year. More than twice as many people as die from uh, auto accidents every year. I mean, it's, it's a lot. breathtaking. And we, so, for whatever it's worth, if you could help us a little on the side with that, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> we'll do. <laughs> I've, I've witnessed firsthand what your foundation and CGI has done. So I want to ask you, and I, and I think it was such a force for good, and I really hope you restart CGI again. Uh, it motivated so many people to do more like I, like me, who made the commitment to you to get to zero preventable deaths. What are the, what are the most important priorities for your foundation right now, and what, what are we going to see? I mentioned a couple of them. We're, we're trying to ramp up our opioid work. We do basically, we do health, economic development, uh, education, and civic engagement. That's basically what we do. And uh, so I'll just mention a few things. We did, oh, I talked about the opioid work. Um, I told you we're going to Puerto Rico. We're doing that as a CGI group. The global initiative, when we had it nationally, internationally every year, we basically had an independent review of all the commitments made. What percentage were kept, what were going to be kept, were people in fact helped or not. And after 11 years, the review, and I had said that we had helped 430 million people in 180 countries. I mean, it was, it's, it, with commitments worth around $100 billion. So, people like you. And what I try to do is just get people together and figure out, you know, how they can help each other do what they want to do. And uh, I would start it again in a heartbeat if I knew they weren't going to be targeted. You know, I, there's, it, and I knew there was, a, there's an appetite for it. People, the only difference between my meeting and all these other fancy meetings is a lot of these other people have many, including people I really respect, like I really like Mike Bloomberg. And he gave all this money to pay for college scholarships at his old alma mater, you know. That's a big deal. Uh, but, they have meetings, and then if rich people want to do something, they can. I have our meetings and people that are like you who are starting and rising. And I think that people go to too many meetings where nobody asks them to do anything. The reason I like your meeting here is that everybody leaves here knowing what they're supposed to do, right? So we just, uh, I never dreamed it'd be as successful as it was because we told them all at the beginning, if you don't promise to do something, or if you do and then you don't even try, then don't come back next year. Please don't come back. We only want people here who are actually going to do. We all go to these meetings. Everybody talks. Do something. It can be small, or it can be big, or it can grow into something big. Sounds but I mean, familiar. we had a college kid <laughs> come up with an idea to find, you like this, drugs that were adulterated. We have one of these for college university students every year, Clinton Global Initiative. And he found a, a way to test it. 
kind of like your non-invasive testing, and he found a way to scan, and more than 25% of the drugs that were being shipped at the time to poor countries were corrupted in some way or another, or ineffective. That young man, he was a penniless college student, and five years later, he sold the company for $450 million because he helped so many people. And now he's out doing more for more people. So I think, you know, I'd like to do it again. But right now, I'm focused on finishing our work in Haiti. We, we raised $500 million for Haiti, and we still got about $100 million to spend. And we're going to try to help Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and Dominica. This is a global issue. We're continuing our climate change work which is an important part of our economic as well as our environmental mission. Our major education initiative is called Too Small to Fail, and Chelsea oversees that. We're closing in on putting a million books out to low-income families in unusual places. We've helped to create 83 new parks around America that are learning parks. And we made a, pop a partnership with, listen to this, 7,000 coin-operated laundry sites because poor people have to go to the laundromat to wash their clothes. And they're sitting there with their kids with nothing to do. So now we're trying to make libraries in all 7,000 of those places. Wow. And we have... Uh, and I love these guys. It turns out they were dying to be asked to do something. They never thought about how much dead time was going on in their places of business where they could actually make something good happen. So we try to do that. We're doing that. And uh, the most fun thing I do probably right now, except for the university meeting, is George Bush and I run a leadership program together that is pretty well evenly divided by party for young professionals, most of them are between 25 and 40. And they go to his library, mine, his dad's library, and London Johnson's library, and study presidential decision making. Then they apply them, what they learn, to contemporary problems, and they try to work things together. And now they're starting local chapters all over America. Because people are just starved for some way to work together and quit fighting. And my, my favorite site was that we had these two Gulf War amputees. They'd lost their legs either in Iraq or Afghanistan. It could have been Afghanistan. And they were these tough guys, and they wound up being best friends with a very imposing, large African-American woman who runs the gay rights movement in Arkansas. And these guys came to me and said, and she did too. She said, we didn't know anybody like them were. We didn't know people like them. You know, we, didn't, we were stunned to see how much we had in common. You know, when you stop carrying around your armor and just open your eyes, it's good things happen. So I love that. that that's a lot of fun. But so I'm trying to stay busy in my old age. So, <laughs> and that's what I'm doing. As long as I can do it and raise the money for it or pay for it, I'll keep doing it. Thank you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Any closing thoughts, comments to, to our team out here? Just remember, almost no group in America would ever be able to make a claim to have done more good unless they save us from a climate catastrophe or avoid a weapons holocaust or a total meltdown in the face of cyber threats than you if you got rid of all preventable deaths. If 70,000 people are dying every year of drug overdoses, but 200,000 are dying of preventable deaths in hospitals. Just think of it, that's just one country. If you could do this globally, think what it would do. And you still don't have anything like the number of partners that you should have. And now you pick the low-hanging fruit, so now you've got to go figure out how to do the hard stuff. And I think, I, I just can't imagine that any of us in our lives could find something more meaningful to do than saving another couple hundred thousand lives a year.
You know, that's more people that are dying in any war currently being waged. Think about that. You can do this. Thank you. Thank you.